Okay, all right, I'd like to call to order the policy uh, committee meeting January 3rd, noting all board members are present. Um, I would need an approval of the agenda. I can just modify the agenda, Ted. At all the right. beginning of today, I'd like to just do the drawing for the town of Vienna seat. We have two candidates. And I'd like to uh, just have us draw. We have to draw which okay. order. Okay. So if I can have somebody do that as as we get before we start into the agenda. Sure. So we have to. Oh, not it. now. Yeah. yeah. Before we start in the agenda. Sure. Don't sure. okay. we'll do that, Tim? So. You draw it. Yeah, no, we draw it. Oh, yeah, I had to red scarf. Well, let's, <laughs> let's make sure she's on screen here. Yeah. Here, put it back. There you go. <laughs> there. Okay, now put it. Perfect. Are we in? There. There you go. <laughs> See who you got. This is who's first. Let's see who's first. Hetzel. Hetzel. So Mark will be first, and then the next person is Ben will be second. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I now move to approve the agenda. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 I do not believe we have any public comments. So, so let's get right into it. All right. The first. Um, item here today is item 443, student conduct. There was a, a couple options that the School Board Association gave us. Both of them were PRG models. As we looked at this one, we modified it and worked with the School Board Association just to make sure that what we were doing was, was in compliance, and it is. We like the idea of having 443 as the policy, but the rule, what we want to do is with regards to classroom conduct, they had one that had a lot of language on it that was similar to what we had, but was different enough that we, um, it was just, it wasn't language per statute, it was this language that they had added to it. Really was similarly in compliance with what our old policy was. Um, so what we have done is modified our old policy to become the rule because it has more of the specifics of it with regards to um, just procedures with regards to student removal from class, et cetera. Um, removal from class pieces are all tied to statute. So those are things that are required for the law. And this is our old policy was in compliance with that. Um, the recommendation was just to have us tie it closer to the PRG. So we want to adopt the policy, the PRG 443. And then instead of the PRG's rule, we want to, we want to modify our current policy um, to serve as the rule. So otherwise, there's really no changes. As with the past, we'll keep them or? Let's let's hold them off until all of them. Yeah, yeah. sounds fine. Okay, 443.9, this is one that we're not doing tonight. This is an anti-bullying one. Again, we're waiting for the Department of Education to rule on their Title IX items. Um, this one we will bring back with other items associated with Title IX once the federal government determines what their regulations will be. Um, the next one is 446, um, and this is with regards to student searches. Um, we have a couple different things. This is actually one that I believe we talked about here previously, mm -hmm. but I think was with regards to wanting to make sure that we had procedures that were in place with regards to this. So the 446 is the policy. Um, this is really kind of boilerplate language that we have with regards to that language. Um, however, for the what we've done for the for the rule is um, just modified the length, the numbering process for that, and have included. This is really our current practice, which is still which is in compliance with any regulations, etc. And then we just added the cross references. Um, at the end. So the last time we were together, we actually looked at this policy. The original recommendation was just to have the policy and not the rule. The committee felt that the rule was important. So as we reviewed that with our admin team, we were fine with keeping the, our current rule. Um, there was one modification where there was a sentence on the bottom of page one that was not complete. Um, and after reading through it, I believe the words that were omitted were for per this policy. So. So uh, looking at the uh, policy, uh, yeah. we get the uh, highlighted. Yeah. Are those, those are in the policy? Um, so you know, there's uh, in the front, uh, yellow and green. Uh, yes, that's correct. 
basically allows us to search the vehicles and it also allows us to run our vehicles. So once you have your vehicle, you're talking about vehicle searches. If you are having a permit and you're parking in a lot, you've opened it up to those searches. Right. And that's something that whenever we run the dogs, we do run them through school and then we run them through the parking lot. It's just vehicles in the lot? Correct. That's the only place we can do it. Yeah. And how often do we do canine searches? Um, usually it ends up being once a year. We haven't done one for a couple of years, just as they're kind of, you have to gather one dog, can't do it. So they have to have a, they'll gather all the canine units from around the area. And then they will kind of schedule with different schools. And then so, we, so there's a schedule to get on. Yeah, there's a schedule to get on. And then they will bring in usually six, seven dogs, and then they will run the school. And then they'll have a schedule usually around the area where they'll, where the law enforcement will help with that. Do they do all the schools or just the high school? We just do the high school. Um, part of it's just a logistical piece as far as the availability of dogs, et cetera. Um, not sure we've done the middle. I don't think we've ever done the middle school, but we always do the high school. So Is there a possibility that you could call them if you had a suspicion? Um, sure. If you had something that you needed that, you could probably pull a dog to do it. But we also... Uh, Part of the, the benefit of being a, a school versus law enforcement is we have greater latitude to do a search. So if we needed to search a locker, backpack, et cetera, we have the ability to do that at, at a lower door. bar than what police do. So for the most part, a, a search with the dogs is just kind of a full screener of the whole school. But if we had like an, an, an issue with an individual that we thought had some substance that they shouldn't have or something in their locker, we have the ability to search that. So that's really what this policy states. And then it talks also about our search procedures. What happens if, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you know, a, a staff member had something discarded? Uh, Same thing. So back to the, the only vehicles on the premises, what's a procedure if one's off the premises? Anything? Not from a school perspective, that would be a more law enforcement perspective. So if you're parked on the street, that's not our jurisdiction. That's different. We we have the ability to do these searches because they're on school premises. Um, just because a student staff member visitor to the school parks, they park off the off of our campus, we we lose our jurisdiction to it. So this is just for us. And there have been situations where we law enforcement have been able to search vehicles and such off campus based off of the knowledge that they learned on campus, but then that falls under yeah. their jurisdiction, yeah. not ours. Okay. The next policy is um, 443.72. This is with regards to um, threats of violence. Um, and some of this, as we reviewed this with our with our attorney, is that some of this is also within um, statute as far as reporting. The one thing that we wanted to make sure we added to it was that in, in the person who's making a report to law enforcement, enforcement we also want to make sure that they're communicating with their building principal or direct supervisor. Um, but there's nothing that prevents somebody from going right to law enforcement first. In most cases, if there was a threat of something that you heard at school, the first place a teacher or staff member would go would be to their principal. Um, the policy basically states that they can go right to law enforcement. Uh, having a school resource officer, that's usually our first go-to whenever we have a situation like that. If, if that person's not available, then we'll get a patrol officer. Uh, but this is really just with regards to violence and any threats of it and the process for being able, for any staff member being able to report it. And this one's articulated in statute. <clears throat> um, all right, student discipline, 447. Uh, what we've had is, there's a couple different things here under, under this policy. First of all, we didn't have just a general discipline policy. We have these had policies for suspension, expulsion, et cetera. But we didn't have one that was just kind of a generic discipline policy. This one really just kind of lays out kind of more a philosophical approach to discipline as far as why it's important. So we think that that, and that was a 
recommendation of the PRG to have one, and we would recommend 447 for adoption. The more meat of this falls within um, the next items. There's there's two pieces here that are different. And I think it, they're very easy to get con confused. Um, 447.1 is use of physical force, restraint, and seclusion. Um, this is kind of the old corporal punishment type of a, of a policy. Obviously, corporal punishment is not allowed, but there are times when you are, when use of, of, of force has a policy and a, and a legal purpose for it. Um, but those are different than seclusion and restraint. So there's two there there as as we work through this with with the attorney there's two different laws that govern both of these they don't necessarily speak the same language so one of the things that I, that I believe Ted you and I talked about when we went through this was with regards to protection of property so the next policy we're talking about is use of seclusion and restraint I can't seclude or restrain a kid just because they're writing on the wall. Um, that's not allowed by seclusion and restraint laws. However, they are able to, <clears throat> you are able to protect property under the other policy as long as it doesn't doesn't con con constitute physical restraint. So that's a little bit of, so you could, I'm not sure, I, don't, I want to be careful with my language, but, but it's basically, you are able to use physical force to protect property as long as it doesn't come to the point where you are restraining a kid. Now you can restrain somebody whenever there's a there's a threat to themselves or others. So you have to be careful as far as how you're defining and making sure that if you are restraining a student, that it, it is a result of, of, of a threat of, of them hurting themselves or, or hurting others. But their threat of them writing on the wall is not a reason to restrain a kid. But if they are doing things that you that you feel you need to restrain to use physical force, um, there is a statute that allows that the protection of property be part of that. So that is added here. It's great. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and the, the the there's two different laws that govern these, and they don't really play nice with each other. So I kind of worked with our attorney to figure out what language I could put there. So for under the protection of property. And we came up with the protection of property to, to avoid the use of force, provided that the use of force does not constitute physical restraint. That was a piece that he felt was kind of better language. And then to remove a disruptive student who possesses an imminent danger to themselves or others. So those were the two pieces that we kind of added there to 447.1. And then the subsequent policy right after it is use of seclusion and restraint. This one is directly, they're both written off of what's required by, by law, but they, they do have kind of very fine differences between them. Randy, uh, you know, using your example of uh, writing on the wall, you know, somebody goes, has a marker, starts to write on the wall, and uh, one staff member just grabs his hand and pulls it back to stop it. Is that considered? Restraint um, could be depends how you do it. Yeah, if you actually grab them and pull them, yeah, that would be considered. The kid was like in this room and was trying to, and you were preventing them from leaving to go out into the other school, and you stood at that door and I stood at this door, and we kept him from leaving to go out into the rest of the school. That's considered seclusion. So when you see the, the seclusion and restraint report that comes in every year to you. It's falling under the second policy. Yeah, the first. So how does, uh, you know, how do you how do you stop that? You, you just kind of get between the uh, the marker and the, and the wall, or you know, sometimes you can, and sometimes you, you have to kind of de-escalate. Right, that's that is the challenge. Right, and then you start to look at um, the student who's turning over a desk. Okay. You can make then the judgment is is that something that is hurting themselves or others? If I take the, the stool and I just push it across the room, probably not. If I'm throwing a desk at you, certainly that's a different situation. The other kid who's um, 
running around the room versus someone who is standing on and trying to climb the bookcase. Those are kind of your differences. So, and these are the, some of the challenges that our staff have when we have a student who has has a moment where they're um, where, where some of these things have to be utilized. So we put some of these rooms in, you know, where you can basically cool them. Correct. You know, if you put them in to cool them, is that is that restraints or is that uh, no? It's locked. It, that doesn't. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, all of those rooms don't have. You can't have a lock on that door, so you can't lock it. But if many of those times, if you can get a student to calm down enough to get into a calming room or a sensory room, um, that's usually the place you want them because it's kind of a sensory overload and you can get them to kind of calm down. As long as we're not barring them from leaving, it's not secluded. But are there times that we do seclude a kid in the room like that, sir? So some of those that you see that come through in the reports, and we don't do a lot of seclusion and restraint, but it does happen. Um, those are a result of usually all of the different efforts. Um, in order to also do things like seclusion and restraint, we have our staff, pertinent staff, are trained in nonviolence crisis intervention. The first piece of that is de-escalation. You have a kid who's escalating. How do you de-escalate them? The last piece you want to do is seclude or restrain it. So you're first working on de-escalating it, trying to make sure you don't get to that point where you have to seclude and restrain. But if it does get there, then what are your strategies to help try to bring the kid down? And then if you're not able to, and there's a danger to themselves or others, then it results in seclusion and restraint. And when that goes, when you go through that process, you know, de-escalate, you do everything, you find it. is all that in some type of written report? Uh, yeah. Um, once you seclude and restrain somebody, um, sometimes it depends on the situation. A lot of, I mean, de-escalation could be anything. It could be a kid who's having anxiety. It could be a kid who's really kind of... Um, it all depends on where it happens and kind of what the impact of it is. Anytime you have a seclusion or a restraint, there ha there's a requirement by law that it has to be a written piece that goes to the parents. So that is something that has to be written up. So that's part of why you see the, the formal report that we do, and Tim submits it to the state for us, but you see it on an annual basis of all the seclusion restraints that happen in any school in given year. Sometimes what you will see is if you see a school that has kind of a spike in them, usually it's one or two kids that we're working with that have continually had the same type of situation that's happened multiple times. These two policies are, I understand the a little bit of the confusion between them. I think we've clarified them as, as best we can, but they are, they're, they're governed by two different uh, statutes and they do have their pieces that are that don't really play real nice together. So I have, I think we've articulated them as clearly as we can. The one we normally deal with is seclusion and restraint is the one that we do most of our training around because that's the one that's the most prevalent one for our staff. I appreciate the addition for the protection property. I, I'm not understanding how it doesn't, and I don't know if that's part of the de-escalation de thing, you know, because <laughs> how, how do you prevent it without physically restraining and I'm assuming if I did something like this, but do this, yeah. I'm restraining him. If I kind of move him away from it, you could probably do that's that's more of the physical okay. contact. That's probably how I would discern that. Okay. But if you're actually holding the kid or you're secluding the or you're, you're keeping them from moving, then you're so then you're restraining them. Okay. But there's probably this was basically talking about use of physical force. It's probably Stronger words than I would use, but it's any time you can place your hand on somebody. Okay. It's very, very fine line with that today. I think we have, we're very careful with what we do and we work with our staff on. Um, our primary training around this is the nonviolence crisis intervention. The first part, this, it's a pretty in depth training that actually talks about how you would actually restrain a student, how you would do it safely. And you need to be trained in that in order to actually do that within your school. So that's why you have certain teams of, of staff within each school who have that. I believe almost all of our staff have the first part of that training, which is the de-escalation. What, what do you do when you have 
several students physically fighting each other. Where is the teacher coming to that? What can they do? Um, that kind of falls into That's both weird. of these. You can move them apart. Physically hold yeah, them. Because yeah. 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 now you're getting into the danger, to, danger yes. to self and others. Most of that is probably just, this falls under kind of the first policy where you're breaking them up. Um, uh, and then you deal with the, the piece from there. Good part is we don't have a lot of that, but we do have to, occasionally that does occur. So, probably more deal with the seclusion and restraint more. We, we don't even deal with that a lot. We've really changed. There used to be seclusion rooms. If you go back 10, 15 years, that was pretty common in schools. Those and are more real, for elementary then too. Yeah, they were pretty, yeah. And I think right now what you're seeing is the more influx of sensory rooms, which are kind of taking that concept of making it more of a cool down room. We've added those to pretty much every building we've built. The new, the new Heritage has several of them. The middle school will have several of them. They have different things within them, like um, there's different lighting in there that you can actually change the color. They're LEDs. Mm -hmm. It's because there's different moods and different things that research-wise impact kids differently and help them calm down. So some of those things are all added in that kind of help with uh, they, helping kids monitor and, and navigate mm -hmm. some of their emotions. You say several of them. Are they do dual-purpose rooms? Do you use them for something? They're not or very they're just big. Small, they're just they're like small. Small. Yeah, yeah, but there's 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 usually one like within every every pod or within every group of, of classrooms. As opposed to just having one that you have to walk a kid all the way across, you're trying to now get somebody across the whole school. Now you want them in closer proximity. They're not very large, but they are definitely they're built for the purpose of just a place to calm down. And it's not only for a kid who I would say is kind of kind of out of control, where you're looking at a seclusion or restraint. It could also be a kid who's just feeling like they are anxious. They're Getting to that point, they're they're you're teaching them how to monitor their own emotions, and they may ask to go to go there for a period. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you're we're working with some of our kids on is you hear it through some of the SEL stuff, the self monitoring piece. It's helping to know when am I feeling like I'm escalating, and then how do I deal with it, and where do I go. So a lot of training goes into not getting to these two things. And but if if they do end up there, these are the two policies and the and the legislation that governs. The next item is 447.2. Um, this is actually on student detention. As we read through this one, we have a policy where we'll talk about, um, we didn't feel we needed the policy on detention. This one basically just says that people can stay after school, but you can't miss the bus. As we read through this policy and we reviewed it, it didn't really have any applicability to us. So we felt that we have the ability to do detentions. We don't need that really within, within the policy piece. So we're asking that one to be repealed. Um, student suspensions and expulsions. We've done a couple different things here. Um, we had the PRG model had suspensions and expulsions as one policy. We've broken it out. We also had suspensions as in-school and out-of-school suspensions, and what we've done is combined them. So the 447.3 is we, we took off the expulsion language. We'll have a separate policy on that in, the, in just a minute. And what we added in here was our in-school and our out-of-school suspension into one policy. And we use those both of those mechanisms in all of our schools. So I think this this just clarifies exactly kind of how we do it and what we need to do for it. So we've really just taken the PRG model, modified it a bit and added our language in for in-school and out-of-school suspension. When you look at the suspension, does that include uh, bus as well? You know, like if uh, there's behavioral issues on, on It bus. does. Um, it, it falls under under the similar statute right? Is only, that we do have the ability to suspend a student this, from the bus. Is that in this policy there? Um, it may just be more generic. 
don't think it's actually articulated. It's talking more about suspension from school. But, in, but school that your school day starts when you get on the bus, so you can suspend for any part of a. So I think it does fit within that. Uh, can we uh, can we train our bus people staff? Yeah, that's just that Lamers does a pretty good job with is trying to work with as they do some training with their um, with their drivers, and I believe we brought some of our staff in in the past to help them with any situations that they have on a bus. Uh, again, we don't have a lot of bus issues here. Mm -hmm. uh, in my day as principal, I dealt with a lot of them, and we just don't see a lot of it here in our district. But certainly there are times where we have a, a student who's not behaving or not doing what they need to. And there are times that we do remove kids from the bus for a period of time. I think to actually kick a kid off the bus requires you to go through an actual expulsion type of proceeding. So we don't normally get to that level, but suspension certainly is something we do. To your point, it's not where we're not, they're not, the individual student isn't in school yet, but are there consequences to their behavior in yeah. transportation to school? Oh, correct. I guess this policy is strictly talking about at school. So it talks about at school, I think. And you can take a look if there should be one that's more specific to bus, but I mean, I would articulate that. You do school, they start. What's that? You just put a few words in there. In this policy to identify when the school day starts. Yeah, let me look into that and see. That's something you and I can touch base with Barry on. And Rebecca, so let's just take a note of that and see how bus suspension falls. I think, you know, one of the things that there, there's no consequence, you know, on, on the bus. And obviously, sure. we don't have a lot, but right. to your point, but, but still. I think uh, that's something that helps, helps, helps to keep the order on the bus. At least there is something to it. Yeah. Right. The, the things that we do right now on the bus that, that you have at latitude with you is is you have the ability to assign seats. You're able to move kids on seats. You can have a kid sit right in the place where they're sitting by themselves in the front of the bus as opposed to the back of the bus. You can have, um, you can suspend them from the bus. So those are things that all happen. Uh, there are certain kids that are who have IEPs that have transportation in them. If they're having challenges on the bus, sometimes we have alternative transportation that provides that's provided to them, so they're not on the regular bus, and we and we provide that. And if there's anybody we ever had to kick off the bus permanently, there's processes to follow. But I'll I'll, I'll double check yeah. and see if this policy, this by its default applies to that, or if there's something we should add in there for the bus. A few words, sure. Right. Like that by school that is taking that. And I think I'll see if I can get that before we have our meeting on Monday. I think they'll they would cover it, right? Okay. Yeah. I think so. So I'm, let me double check with um with Harry and see where he's at. So suspension, the in school, out of school, we put all those pieces together. Um the next item we have is expulsions. And this is, I mean, you guys have seen what we do for expulsions and this generally um, follows exactly our process. I do have one question out to our attorney, which I don't have back from him yet. And I will get before we meet on Monday. And it's with regards to early reinstatement of expelled students. Um, and that, that's the provision that we use very on every, every one of our expulsions as we go through an expulsion process. And then we have a real an early reinstatement to continue their education. Our policy gives me a quite a bit of power within there as a superintendent to revoke that early reinstatement. And I just wanted clarification from our legal counsel with regards to is that truly the power of the superintendent to do that, or at what point does it have to come back to the board? And as I kind of read through it, I believe I have the power to to revoke the early reinstatement, but I don't have the power unless it's written in the order to change the placement of where students. So I think if we had a student that we wanted to revoke the early reinstatement and they're expelled and out, I think I have the power to do that. However, if we wanted to move a kid, for example, from the high school to the TLC building, unless we had articulated that that was something that could happen within the order, I think that has to come back to the board. And we've brought a few of those back in the last couple of years. 
but I, I, as I read through this kind of just to make sure the language was where we wanted it, um, I did pose that question to our legal counsel just for clarification, but otherwise this follows what we do right now. The next item is with regards to suspension and exp expulsion of students with a disability. Um, this is all pieces that are tied to, to statute with regards to what we have to do. Um, so this is something we follow for any student with a disability um, under an expulsion. Just for kind of your clarification, if a student does something that's expellable, the first thing a student with a disability has to go through is a hearing an IEP hearing where they determine if it's a manifestation of their disability or not. If it is a manifestation of their disability, then the expulsion doesn't go forward. Then they modify the IEP to address the behavior. That can include anything up to a 45 day where we um, are going through a 45 day alternative placement or some other pieces that we have latitude to do. Um, this happens probably 25% of our items that, are, that have ex expellable expenses involve kids with disabilities where they manifest in where it's determined that it's a manifestation of their disability. This is the policy that governs it and it's governed by state and federal law. The last item I have here today is student insurance program. And the only thing, this is one that Steve manages. This is something that we do often and there's just a he's just making a very quick modification that and the first just making the first sentence just shorter and easier to understand and it just says a student accident insurance program providing broad coverage will be made available to students and parents um, and then he took out that on a voluntary basis provided by the district and annual meeting approval so that doesn't need to be there it's something we offer um, and it's something as you're registering your kids you can you can inquire about Few, few people do every year, not a lot, but it does, is something that is available. So we talk about insurance, is it health insurance? Or is it, is it it's insurance? like an accident insurance. It gets for, most parents have some level of, uh, usually have their own insurance, but this is for ones that have um, other we, coverage for the kids. And do we pay for that as, as the uh, district? Uh, uh, there's so many participants there just whether it's possible being exploration. That's a great question. I don't know. I'll find that out for you. I think they do. I think we offer it, they pay for it. But I let me just double check before I speak incorrectly on that. I think it's just a, it's just an add-on insurance piece that we can have and people can sign up for and pay for. So we're taking out the uh, on a voluntary basis. Could that uh, refer to, you know, we're offering you a program at a discount or whatever, you know, and you can take it on a voluntary basis, and, uh, meaning that you're going to pay for it. Right. I think the question, yeah, and I think I'm is it, I'm ninety nine percent sure this is something that they pay. For. It's not something we offer to every family, so I'm sure that they're paying for it. It's just at a reduced rate. I'll find more details out about it. The language we have here just basically says that we're going to make it available. So available, it's, I, I, I kind of equate it to for our employees, we offer a short, short term and long term disability. Short term disability, we offer it to you. If you want it, you pay for it. I think it's a similar type of thing here for um, accident insurance. But I'll double check and see how that piece works and bring that. Is back. that how the wording you're concerned with? It says will be, you know, you're, tip, you're taking out the voluntary, but if you say the broad coverage will be well, guess, available. Yeah, that made available to uh, parents and garden, guardians on a voluntary basis. Sure. So we're going to offer this and you can pay for it if you want. Sure. You know, and that's, I, I guess that's the recap, the way I would read it. Uh, All right, let me talk to Steve and Allie and then I'll bring that back on Monday when we bring it back forward. So those are all the policies that we have. So the ones that I think we have to look into yet are um, this one to bring back the, the, the language in the first paragraph, the expulsion 
piece as I get more information from our uh, our attorney, just to make sure that our reading of it and my reading of it is accurate. There was one more. Oh, looking at the bus suspension on 440 to see if that can be added. So I will bring those back as we bring these forward to the board. So I'll take the motion to uh, approve those policies with those noted and that noted um, investigation evidence. Motion to move moving forward with the uh, final exception. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And with that, I'll take the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for waiting. Sorry, it's late. Not a problem.